your iconic six sixes or three consecutive hundreds in ODIs. Which is more special? I think the you know the six sixes was a bit more you know spontaneous. Um, before I hit that, I originally thought that Sir Garfield Sobers did it in in a Test match or in international cricket. Um, so when after actually hitting the six six, <laughs> I could actually you could see me laughing, and I wasn't too. You know, it wasn't such a big deal for me because I had originally thought that Sir Garfield Sobers did it in a test match. And it's only after the game that I found out that uh, I was the first person to hit six sixes in, interna in, in international cricket. So it made that feat quite special um, compared to the con three consecutive ODI hundreds. Um, I now got I was not out on 96 for the for my fourth inning. So unfortunately, four innings, four hundreds in a row eluded me on that particular occasion. But I'd have to give I'd have to say the six sixes are probably more proud of seeing that I was the first to do it in international cricket. What was it like creating history with South Africa's epic 438 chase versus Australia? Yeah, the iconic, uh, iconic 4-3-8 game, as it's as it's uh, as known. Um, what a wonderful day! I think uh, um, it, it all started. Uh, I think, uh, as far as me personally was concerned, the, prep <laughs> the preparation was quite interesting the day before the game. I'm not going to go into too much detail with regards to that, but but basically, the, the preparation wasn't ideal. But um, yeah, it was just a fantastic day. I think uh, it was a day that started at 10 o'clock in Johannesburg. Um, and, and, and a wonderful wicket. I think, uh, you know, um, halfway through the innings, you know, Australia's innings, after around maybe 25, even 30 overs, uh, we could see that they were obviously getting amongst it and, you know, in line to do, uh, to, to do real damage with the bat. Um, and it, and it happened to be that way. I think uh, what what struck me about that particular game, or when they actually got to to 400, they, you know, they were the first team to get to 400, and um, you could see them laughing and real jovial, and and rightly so. You know, they were the first team to get to 400, so they were there was a lot to be proud of. You know, I spoke to my good friend Adam Gilchrist. You know, it was something that they were working towards. They wanted to be. You know, wanted to get to 400, and that particular day they got to 400, and um, you know they end up getting a, a 434, um, which was obviously a huge, a huge score. Um, and halfway through, at the turnaround after their 50 overs, because we had taken so long to bowl our 50 overs, the turnaround time was only 15 minutes rather than the you know the half an hour or the 25 minutes that you'd normally have. And um, we had a quick chat. Mickey Arthur, you know, basically he said uh, we could be around 200 after 25 overs. You know, we're going to try and give ourselves the best chance of, of trying to knock down the score. So um, it just so happened that you know myself I and mean, we lost put the dip in our early. I got into I got in early in the second over, and myself and Graham got things started. You know, the wicket was really good. Um, and we basically knew that if we didn't score a boundary every over, that we were going to, you know, be behind the run rates. And that's exactly what happened. You know, we we got things going. The wicket was that good. Uh, and you know, if if of the first five balls of the over there wasn't a boundary scored, we knew just to keep up with the run rate that uh, the sixth ball had to go for a boundary. And that's and that's how we put, uh, approached that particular innings um, and yeah I mean we we got things going up front the momentum was there and you know Graham unfortunately also he played a fantastic game a fantastic innings got 90 odd or 50 balls and that just set the tone for the rest of the innings and everybody when you're talking about a team effort you know I don't think you've probably seen in one day cricket at least you wouldn't have seen a more complete team effort with regards to uh, one-day cricket play, you know, for South Africa. I think, uh, you know, everybody 
that particular day. Whether or not it was the bowlers, the bowlers went for plenty of runs, but they also made up for the bat. And Toll, you know, even Mackay and Tini's single coming in at number 11, you know, was a huge moment in the game. Um, and yeah, we, we end up, you know, chasing the score down. And I think if I look back at that particular game, it made no difference who won that game. I think the game itself was just an unbelievable game. It was a fantastic spectacle for the sport. Um, and luckily enough for us, we, we came out in, you know, tops uh, that particular day. And everybody that witnessed it live, you know, was extremely lucky and privileged to, to witness that game, to be part of it. It was an unbelievable privilege to have center stage in that game for a couple of hours when I, when I was batting was probably the icing on the top, but uh, I think the whole world knows that that was an ex exceptionally special game and I doubt whether we're going to see a game like that again for a very long time. Give us three reasons why you feel cricket is a batsman's game. Three reasons why I think you know cricket is a batsman's game. Because a lot of the rules favour more the batsman than the bowler. You know, for instance, you're only allowed one bouncer in, in one day cricket more little things like that. You have the wide line, um, which obviously favours you know the, the batters, the team batting. Um, all little things like that. Uh, you know, I think teams, also people want to see runs scored. You know, if, the score, if there's no scores, if not a high score, if it's a low scoring game, it's not always the, the best from a spectacle point of view, but it can also be quite pet, uh, competitive. Um, but I just think in, in general, the rules apply more for for the, for the batsman the rather than the bowler. Which are your top three cricket stadiums in the world and why? Top three stadiums around the world, I'd probably have to say Newlands, obviously, very iconic simply because of Table Mountain. The backdrop is unbelievably pretty. Um, it's quite in, you know, inspirational you know, when you walk out to bat in Newlands, knowing the history of the, of the ground as well and uh, just the scene, you know, the scenery is is fantastic. Um, that particular guy, uh, stadium, Newlands. The other stadium would be, for me, if I had to pick one in India, I would have to say uh, Eden Gardens. Um, it's a very special place for me because that's where I made my test debut. Um, I remember we ended up winning that game. Um, and as far as I know, I was told that there was almost 100,000 every day for those five days. So you could imagine it was virtually almost half a million people that, that came to the ground over the five days. So um, exceptionally special to me, uh, Eden Gardens. And then the other, other stadium I'd have to single out would be the MCG in Australia. Um, you know, it's, it's an enormous stadium and I can also seat over 100,000 people. You do feel like uh, like a gladiator in, in you know in a coliseum. You feel exceptionally small in the middle of the ground. Lots of noise. <laughs> Lots of rude Australian fans, and uh, they love to give you a little spray and, and tell you where you you know where to come off and where to go on. But uh, I think uh, those three stadiums for me stand out from all the other rest. Who were your cricketing idols growing up? My cricketing idols. There were two uh, in particular. Viv Richards, uh, Viv Richards, uh, and Peter Kirsten. Um, although I did, I didn't see too much of, of, of Viv playing uh, international cricket. Um, we were very much, obviously, with you know apartheid and, and our isolation. We didn't see a lot of international cricket played in early '80s. So, uh, but Peter Kirsten, Peter Noel Kirsten, definitely one of my heroes, um, and another one that I was lucky enough to play alongside was uh, Daryl Cullinan. Rugby is a big sport in South Africa, but what got you interested in cricket? And what was your first match like? So what got me interested in cricket was simply because I was a weak swimmer. I hated swimming at, as a kid. I never used to like swimming. Um, so it, it just was natural to, uh, you know, to play cricket as a summer sport. Uh, and um, I just, in my first game, I remember I was at St. Joseph's College, we played against, against Bishops. I ended up giving 76 not out in a, in a you know, 25 of a game, I think it was. So um, I fell in love with, 
with the with the game with the sport right from my first game so i think from a career point of view i think i got off to a good start which two international cricket teams do you love watching play against each other my favorite two international teams that i i enjoy um i think you know the india pakistan game is always quite heated you know there's a lot of emotion that comes with that and a lot of pride a lot of ego um and know uh, there's a lot of heat you know and uh i think that that particular game is is one where is played with a lot of intensity a lot of fire it can be very it can boil over and be quite emotional the other one i think is also the ashes uh, australia and, and england you know that can be quite heated as well but uh those two particular games those four countries i think um when it comes to intensity and fire you know you you saw them get better than that who is the toughest bowler you faced during your international career toughest bowler i'd face i'd have to say uh shane uh, shane warne um exceptionally accurate i mean he he mastered the art of of leg spin it's the most difficult ball to bowl in 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 cricket um and yeah i mean he, he was exceptionally you know accurate he just also very very shrewd very sharp you know he always had a little smart little something to say you know and he always said it at the right times as well so you could never you know relax with him not that you you can ever relax when when you're batting but uh, especially against him he was very sharp very witty uh you could also be a little bit nasty at times but uh very clever and and probably the most accurate bowler and best bowler of us playing or coaching cricket which do you like better playing or coaching what do i prefer or what do i enjoy more i think you know i played i was lucky enough i played first class cricket for 25 years um i played against you know some of the best names the games will ever see um and that was also in, that was enjoyable and obviously you look back at it and you know to realize that the 90s and and 2000s you know 2000 to 2010 i think those 20 years were probably you know it's up for you know it's it's is up for debate but probably the strongest 20 years of international cricket has ever been you know you just got to look at the amount of test hundreds that were scored the amount of wickets that were taken um and to play in that era i think was was unbelievably great it was a huge privilege coaching different thing you know i'm you know i'm sharing my my experiences sharing my knowledge that I gained over the those 25 years and I'm still you know gaining knowledge now as as a coach so I think one as far as playing was concerned I think I was exceptionally lucky to to have played with some of the best game names the game has ever seen and coaching I'm just as lucky because hopefully I, you know I can make these kids understand and and also just coach you know, coach them and teach them Uh, you know what worked for me maybe what work what should work for them but also just passing the knowledge that I gained over those 25 to 30 years what was your best batting partnership in international cricket oh, i'm lucky uh, to be able to share um, three three under run partnerships with graham smith um, we were the only opening pair to do that and to achieve this feat so very proud of that particular record What is the one piece of advice you'd give to young cricketers today? Best advice I'd probably give you is not to take anything for granted because you have an opportunity to showcase your talent. Some people love it, some kids will have more talent than others, but there's never a substitute for uh this should never be you should never take anything for granted because you have an opportunity to display your your talents. So never take anything for granted, make sure that you you stay fit enough to be able to play to your potential uh whether or not you know you're a batsman or a bowler but remember also there's the other aspect of of cricket and that's fielding and if you're not fit and and you're unfit that's going to show in the field you never want to do that how did you train to become an explosive batsman and one of the best fielders um i was lucky enough because i was i was blessed with a with a bit of speed you know I was I was I was quite quick in my time and uh, you know I always had I had likes of obviously Johnny Rhodes, uh, Errol Stewart, Derek Crooks, Hal Benkenstein, 
for all guys that were very quick, you know, and in our practices we always pushed each other, you know, to the limit basically, whether it was, you know, throwing at the stumps, diving, uh, catching, diving, you know, dive catches, all that sort of thing. So the good thing was that there was always intensity in the, in the fielding practices. Uh, and if there's no intensity, the right intensity in fielding, in the practices, it's going to show in your fielding when it comes to the game. So first and foremost, when you actually practice, whether you're practicing with a friend or whether you're practicing on your own, um, make sure that the intensity is right. The one person you'd love to talk cricket with on a long haul flight? Um, that particular person would have to be Gilton Ackerman. Was my coach when I was 16 years old. Uh, he was the coach of Western Province uh, when I made my debut. And he was the coach for Western Province then, and then he moved on to being the coach for Western Province B team. And what I remember about him was that we always used to, he always used to tell us his long, his fantastic stories about previous uh, past players. And that was very inspirational, not only to me, but to the B team and to the A team as well. You know, the guys that, that played under him. Um, he, he made it exceptionally special. Uh, and he was very much a, um, <clears throat> you know, he made you love the game even more and more passionate about the game simply with how he spoke to us and very inspirational with his stories. Who would your top five batsmen be, apart from yourself, in your dream team? Well, um, look, I think if I'm going to go with the top five, because I, hopefully people would see me as an entertainer, I would have to go my top five entertaining, you know, entertaining batsmen. Not so much, the, you know, not so much technically, but if we can talk about entertainment and giving people, you know, their money's worth uh, with regards to entertainment, um, I'd have to go opening. I'd have to go with Seawag, Verinda Seawag, definitely opening. The other one would be Matthew Hayden, other opener. I think well, number three, I'd maybe bring in uh, uh, Sachin Tendulkar. Number four, definitely Brian Lara. Um, and I'd put in, no, no, number four, I'd put Ricky Ponting. And number five, I'd put Brian Lara, definitely. Tell us the South African slang that you tend to use and overuse. In South Africa, we like to say, is it? We say, is it? Which means, you know, if you say, is it? You ask, it's almost like a rhetorical question. So when we reply, you, you, you give us a question, you ask us a question, but it's not a direct question, it's more a rhetorical question, and we reply, is it? And in Australia, they can't understand that because they look at you and go, yes, it is. It's been quite a while since you retired. Name one thing that you like and dislike about modern day cricket. Um, what I like about modern day cricket, what I like and what I dislike, what I like, uh, the, in the inventiveness. You know, there's been a lot of shots that have, uh, you know, over the last couple of years that were not played back in the day when I was still playing. That's, that's what I do like. Um, what I dislike is the amount of it played. You know, I'd like, like I just said, I'd like to see more, more test cricket played. Um, it's always a lot more interesting, simply because, you know, like being a batsman, hitting, hitting sixes is something that I, I could do. We see a lot more of that these days, so it's, it's almost become a little bit too easy. And the size of the field, so I don't, you know, one dislike, for me, you know, the fields, you know, the, the, the size of the field should actually be a minimum of like 70 meters. You know, some, some of these, you know, these batters are miss hitting sixes, which is a little bit unfair on the bowlers, simply because the grounds are so small. You know, um, I think your, your average six is probably around 70, 75 meters. That for me should be the standard size boundary, just to give the, you know, make the bowlers, you know, a bit more happy probably. Every cricketer has a distinct style. What stands out for Herschel Gibbs? Um, so my style of cricket was just flamboyant, you know, instinctive, um, spontaneous. 
I was very much a sea ball, hit ball sort of player, but you know, when it came to test cricket, I couldn't always do that. And to curb that natural instinct was very hard, very hard a lot of the time, simply because you had to, you know, respect the bowler and respect the conditions that you're playing in. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, hoping I gave the people their money's worth with regards to my style of, of batting. What inspired your book to the point and its candid account of your ups and downs? Um, the book came about after a very uh, an interview I did for GQ magazine. Um, that particular, the author of my book, Steve Smith, him and I did the interview for GQ after my little month that I did in Rio in 2008. And the interview went really well. Um, it was well received. And he basically, he then asked me, you know, maybe we should try and do a book because <laughs> it's been more than eventful off the field, on and off the field. And, you know, there was enough to, to write about and, and, and to put, to, uh, put together. So we chose topics on, on which to, for me to, to talk about. Um, and I think the way in which he wrote the book was almost like me, you know, telling a story. Um, so the book was well, was well written and well received and you know a lot of people enjoyed it.